Um, and I think that's it on the technical side of things. Sam, do you remember if uh, I have anything to add? I'm just going to welcome everyone. We're so pleased and it's such an honor to have you gathered from all around the world uh, today to listen to Louise von Flotto, Ala Kamal and Olga Castro for the launching of the handbook of translation, feminism and gender. Uh, I start with a very short presentation uh, of the Felicité webinar. Uh, Felicité means uh, felicity in French and it's also an acronym uh, for online feminisms, circulations and translations uh, and editions. The, this Felicité adventure started in 2017 when my colleague Vanina Motikonachi and I participated as a um, translator uh, resident uh, to one week uh, translation workshops on human and social science uh, with some people who are present here with us today. We arrived there with feminist perspectives and texts, but uh, in the workshop I attended, all the translator residents were women and we soon realized that almost all of us were translating men and that uh, the human science editors or directors we were introduced to were men also. As our main interest uh, was in gender studies, we decided with Vanina Mutikonechi to create uh, our own uh, research program uh, and workshops on feminist traductology and feminist translation studies together with Noemi Grunenwald, translator of Bell Hooks and Sylvia Federici, and Eloise Thomas, uh, who has sp speak, uh, spoken just before me and works in American studies on representation of history and apocalypse in literature through a feminist, queer, and decolonial uh, perspective. Cornelia Moser, uh, known for a book called Feminism in Translation, Traveling Theories, Cultural Translation, is also one uh, of our many members uh, in Felicity. Our main goal uh, was to organize monthly workshops from English, Arabic, Spanish, Italian uh, to French. For this, I have to thank Toria Fili Toulon, Françoise Orazi, Stéphane Lafranchi, Armel Girinon, Charlie Brousseau, and Léa Guatois. And second, we wanted to organize a seminar on translation and circulation of feminist concepts and tools. Uh, this is where you are invited today. Uh, when I speak of circulation, and I'm sure many of you encounter the same problems, uh, I'm not only referring to the way uh, we <laughs> Hello from me. And the patriarchal and colonial me. writing of history, or of the tabooing of unspeakable structural phenomena such as violence, rape, or feminicide. But I'm also referring to the practical problems uh, we encounter in France. Uh, with the lack of feminist translation studies. Um, indeed, um, and perhaps you have the same problems, despite uh, many very good French individual papers or collectives on the subject, there's no such thing uh, as a feminist translation study department in French universities. Uh, it's uh, unwanted or unheard of. Worse, the classical way of teaching traductology our translation studies in France is often uh, old fashioned and done from a male perspective. Despite this fact, uh, despite the fact that Laurie Chamberlain wrote about sexist translation metaphors and a new feminist agenda for translation studies in the 80s, uh, in 2020, those metaphors are still prominent in France, uh, in our country, uh, in the way that we teach translation and traductology. So we decided to uh, share and make sure that Laurie Chamberlain and all the great uh, researcher uh, like you will never be unheard of again in translation to studies department, at least in Lyon uh, and perhaps if possible in France. That's how Felicity started, a way of getting rid of the world circulation impediment problems we have in social and human science academics, the silencing, uh, tabooing or shushing of feminist voices. I think that the Rutledge Handbook of Translation, Feminism and Gender is one of the major keystones to this liberating path. That's why it's such uh, really an honor for us that Ala Kamal, uh, Luis von Floto and Olga Castro, very well known uh, for their work and expertise in the field of travel of feminist uh, concepts and feminist uh, translation have accepted our invitation. So Olga Castro is an associate professor in translation studies uh, at the School of Modern Languages and Culture at Warwick University. 
She has co-directed feminist translation studies, local and transnational perspectives. And she is also one of the handbook uh, contributors, like probably many of you behind the screen. So now, at last, I will let her introduce uh, Luis von Floto, Ala Kamal, and their presentation of the handbook. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Helais. I feel really, really honored uh, to be uh, here today. Merci beaucoup. Many thanks for inviting me uh, to chair this webinar. It is a privilege to have this opportunity to discuss with Hala Kamal and Louise von Flotto the groundbreaking Rowledge Handbook of uh, Gender, Feminism and Translation. Um, it was not so long ago that I came across all the work that you are developing at the Felicité project in Lyon. And I can only say, I wish I could be there, you know, and attend all the activities, all the seminars that you are organizing. The program looks amazing. Um, you've put together an amazing list of events to foster discussion around issues of gender and translation from a truly, truly interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, the fact that this event today is taking place as an online webinar is really important because it gives the opportunity to many of us who cannot be in France, in Lyon today, to participate, to share our views, uh, and also to ask questions to Hala and Louise um, at, the, at the end of their presentation. So again, thank you very much, but not only for inviting me to chair this webinar, but also for organizing it. I, I, I really think more events like these should uh, indeed be organized, and we should make the most of technology to carry on organizing things like this. Um, without any other um, distraction, I, I just wanted to introduce the speakers now, and then I will provide some kind of um, main themes that I would like uh, them to, um, to discuss during the presentation. But of course, we will have time afterwards for questions and further discussion. So um, Hala, Hala Kamal, she's one of the um, co-editors of, of this uh, book. And we've had like a kind of um, a discussion, the three of us, Louise, Hala and myself, and I asked them, what would you like me to emphasize about your career and your approach to this topic, because you can easily find her CV online and her publications, but I really wanted to know um, what's the part of her CV that she wanted um, me to emphasize today. So uh, Hala tells me that she is one, she is the one, I mean, she, she has initiated, sorry, feminist translation as praxis in Egypt and to the best of her knowledge, also in translation into um, Arabic. Her interest in feminist translation came as a corollary to her in involvement with feminism uh, as an academic and also as an activist. She has focused her translation on translating feminist texts into Arabic and mainly feminist scholarship and that triggered her interest in exploring the intersection between feminism and translation studies. Um, it was in the early years of the millennium that she came across Louise's work, and as it happened to many of us, she was hooked. Um, her area of expertise is not translation studies uh, per se, but women's writing and particularly personal narratives. But of course, she's looking at that from a translation uh, perspective. Uh, feminist translation is taught in the course Translation and Gender that she initiated in the, EMA, in the MA program uh, of Politics of Translation at the University of Cairo. Most of her work is done in relation to feminism and gender in general, and also gender and translation in particular, as it happens in Egypt, in the civil society, specifically with feminist organizations, where the issue of translating feminist thought and feminist philosophy texts both ways, English into Arabic and Arabic into English, has been a really important um, issue. She's going to tell us today a little bit more about the Feminist Translation Project at the Women and Memory Forum, 
So um, yeah, watch the space for that. And of course, Hala was telling me that the Rowledge Handbook was a major milestone um, to her as an academic as well. And working and learning from uh, Luis throughout the past years was a very enriching and productive experience. So now about Louise, well, what can I say? She is the big name in the field, I guess. All of us are familiar with her 1997 book, Gender and Translation, Translate, Translating in the Era of Feminism. Uh, that was one of the first publications in the field. Um, just to, um, because she's been in the field for so long, uh, I think she has a really privileged um, uh, vision of, of how things have been evolving. And something she would like to stress is that at the moment she is receiving a large number of PhD um, um, projects um, and she's supervising a lot of, PH, of PhD students as well, mainly with international students from China, from Iran, Morocco, Turkey, Mexico. And something that really uh, fascinates her is the diversity of topics that all these PhD students are addressing. Um, so some of them are working on aspects of gender and translation, some others on the ethics of translation, cultural diplomacy and literary translation, and, and so on and so forth. So this is a great uh, variety of topics that says a lot about the vivid picture of, of uh, the discipline at the moment. She's also doing an increasing number of peer reviews, peer reviewing exercises. Uh, and that means that she's very well aware of all the publications of everything that is going on in the field. So international authors, um, uh, scholars, publishers, and in, in her opinion, and I'm sure she will tell us more about this in a minute, this is a sign of the enormous reach of translation studies and feminist translation studies today. But not everything is bliss or joy. She's, um, she was also sharing with me that She's having at the moment a tentative move uh, towards producing more literary translations. And this is not going necessarily very well. So translations uh, of literature from French and German into English are of very little interest in the Anglophone market, in the English speaking uh, book industry. So publishers do not want to uh, take any risks and I would say, I would add, unless you go with um, small independent publishers, the big transnational corporations do not want to take any risks. So she has completed two full length book translations in the past year, but she is struggling to find publishers. Uh, Louise, you can tell us a little bit more about this uh, later, but something she wanted to emphasize is the paradox in the English language academia, so that uh, a lot of uh, th there is a proliferation of, of works and influence in translation studies, producing countless handbooks, manuals, academic articles, journals, monographs, etc. But there is um, there is uh, not much translation into English, uh, and this is, uh, according to her, and, and I would agree, a paradox. All right, so after this um, introduction to the speakers today, I would like to highlight some themes so that in a way could um, um, use, be used as a threat uh, during the presentation. As uh, Heloise and Sam said at the beginning of this webinar, the publication of this handbook is a milestone in research in gender and feminist translation studies. The handbook includes chapters about 20 something different geopolitical contexts written by academics, practicing translators, scholars, coming from different academic backgrounds too. My question is, how did the project come into being? I do remember a call for papers went out and I know the response was amazing but how did you select the topics, the themes, the chapters that made the cat? Um, another 
aspect in relation to that is that, of course, Rowledge is an Anglophone publisher, and so all the chapters had to be written in English, which has become, um, we like it or not, the lingua franca in academia. And sometimes it, it just it, it seems that you only exist if you write in English. But English is not only the language, it's also the conventions in academic writing. And the authors of these chapters all come from different academic backgrounds. What are the challenges when having um, to, to, to work with this variety of academic backgrounds? How did the review process um, go? And finally, is there any way around this? What are the alternatives to, if any, uh, to um, publishing in English? Why not publishing in Arabic and then get it translated into English or, or in French? Hmm? This is uh, a bit of an yeah, um, open question, but maybe something uh, the speakers would like to, to address. Um, my third main theme or topic is about um, intersectionality, the, the geographical uh, or geopolitical expansion that the field is experiencing at the moment, but also the object of study. So at present, feminist translation studies is experiencing fruitful interdisciplinary encounters with a great variety of research fields. We may think about machine translation, about feminism and interpreting, uh, feminism and working conditions of translators, um, black feminist scholarship in translation, to name just a few. This growth in the interdisciplinary encounters is somehow reflected in the contents of the handbook. Just as a reminder, the handbook is structured around five main topics, five parts, translating and publishing women, translating feminist writers, feminism, gender and queer in translation, number four, gender in grammar, technologies and audiovisual translation, and finally, chapter five, these courses in translation. So I know there is a limitation in the, in the number of um, articles that you can feed into a handbook um, and you cannot include absolutely all topics. But my question is, is there any particular topic that you would like to have covered because you think it's a pressing issue? I would really like interpreting to be there. Um, so any particular topic that you would like to have covered that is not in the handbook for whatever reason. Um, and one final uh, point, and this is more about the ethics of transnational feminist academics working in a, in a field like this, which is very committed as well. So transnational feminist academics like Hala, like Louise, like many of us, um, who are publishing with big corporations, who charge really, really expensive, um, um, well, the price of the book is really, really expensive and it's not affordable to many people. So I remember when the publication of this handbook was announced in the Feminist Translation Studies discussion list, there were quite a few interesting posts by colleagues working in Brazil and in other Latin American countries saying there is no way, at least no legal way, <laughs> we can access the book. The price is just too much. It's more than what a university professor earns a month in some countries. Not even the university library can afford it. Um, yeah. So the spirit of the book was to bridge the gap between the North and the South, but in fact, the book could be itself making this gap bigger. My question is, um, what do you think we could do to avoid situations like this in the future? Should we stick to these um, um, renowned publishers? Should we maybe move away from them and, and go for publishers who offer open access or free access? But then, of course, there is this 
uh, thing about the reputation of the publisher as well. And those of us working in universities in the global north are getting more and more pressure um, from our employers, the ones paying our salaries, um, so that we go you know, with these renowned publishers. It's a tricky situation from an ethical point of view. I would be very, very interested to know what your views are on this. Is there any way out? All right, so I'm gonna leave it here now. Um, just, um, I'm, I'm gonna um, give the floor to Louise and Hala. They are gonna speak for around um, an hour and then um, I'm gonna ask, or maybe, well, less than that, we'll see, um, um, an hour maximum, so that we have time for a discussion afterwards. Louise, Hala, many thanks, and the floor is yours. And you have to unmute yourselves. We cannot uh, listen to you now. We cannot hear you. Yeah, Louise, Louise go ahead first, please. Okay, who shall start? Hala or me? Louise, go ahead, please. Okay, all right. So, uh, again, good morning from Canada to everyone, and thank you so much for joining us, and thank you to the Felicité uh, people for organizing this. This is the first, um, first kind of celebration, in a way, of the publication of this massive book. Here it is. And I'm so glad that we can actually present it and talk about it and talk about some of the challenges and, and difficulties, but also some of the, the fun and the interest that came out of this book for Hala and myself, I think, in putting it together. So first, um, I don't know whether I should answer all these questions that, that um, uh, Olga has asked. But maybe I'll just start off very briefly about how Hala and I uh, got together. And here, Poland plays a really interesting role uh, because we met at a conference in Poland, um, in Kielce, Poland, in, I don't know, men, maybe three and a half years ago or so. And from there on, I then went to Cairo, to Hala, to meet with Hala, and then from there we decided that it was time, or she had already been talking about doing such a book with Rutledge, with Mona Baker, with, I can't remember, and then we decided to do this book and to, to present a proposal to Rutledge, and it went from there, about maybe two and a half years ago or so. So it took quite a while to put together, and I think what I think is the most interesting part for me in this, this whole thing was the enormous interest from young scholars to participate and young international scholars. So away from the, what I've started calling the Anglo-American Eurozone and bringing in, bringing in people and, and getting uh, approached and offers of work from people from all over the world. And, and I think that was really the most surprising and the most challenging and the most interesting and stimulating part of this uh, book where you are constantly as an editor constantly confronted with ideas and situations and contexts and problems that you've never thought of yourself ever and and have to try and understand yourself so first of all the polish aspect and the East European aspect that came with articles from, from Bulgaria, from Russia, from Tatiana, who I saw was here somewhere on, on the web, from Novosibirsk, and from then from Egypt, all the articles that, that uh, Hala was able to, to uh, yeah, try and persuade people to write material from China and from India, and then from South America too. So good. The only place that we didn't manage to get work from is sub-Saharan Africa. And we tried, we tried, we tried, we wrote to people, we tried to uh, get, um, contact people who know people and who can then perhaps persuade someone to write an article. And we worked and worked and worked with someone to try and get, get an article into shape. And uh, yeah, so that, that is the one uh, loss, the one, big gap um, that um, uh, that Olga mentioned. What are the gaps? There's that one very big gap. 
perhaps also questions of black feminism that Olga also mentioned right now. There's a gap in that direction. And uh, one very interesting article that I would have loved to see completed, which couldn't be completed, which came from Kuwait and was on the topic of the difference in language between family discipline in Arabic and the only term in English which exists, which is honor killing. And the in incredible gap, linguistic, cultural, um, yeah, political gap between those two terms and how translators working from Arabic to English, working for the NGOs that are working in Arabic countries and, and trying to deal with this problem or trying to help uh, assuage this problem um, are constantly confronted with. That article, unfortunately, did not get completed and did not come in. However, a lot of interesting material from the Middle East did come, and from China, from India, as I said, and from South America. So uh, we managed to um, break out of what had seemed so long to be just Anglo-American and European work on feminism and translation. And I think the other thing that I really enjoyed and really um, found interesting is how this material um, went into pragmatic issues, not just writing about literary texts and literary translations, although there is a lot of that, uh, especially with regard to the, the proto-feminist uh, writers such as um, Mary Wollstonecraft, or in translation, or Simone de Beauvoir in translation, and so on. Those, those texts are there and they're good. Um, but we also have articles on uh, feminism and misogyny and problems with, with language around those topics in machine translation. I had never read about that. I think it's fascinating and I think it's superbly interesting and important to look at how machine translation is turning the wheel back to making every reference to a doctor a masculine and references to nurses feminine automatically because these machines are fed by all sorts of texts that have not necessarily been vetted um, in regard to gendered language. So machine translation uh, on the translation of health uh, texts about women's reproductive health and obviously the big example is our bodies ourselves and how that text has moved or not into chinese into uh, various other languages among them serbian and into french with nesrin besai and so on um, texts on uh, video game translation how does language and how do how do the aspects of gender and language play into video game translations, probably video games as well, but specifically video game translations, another topic that has hardly been addressed and hopefully will, yeah, will, will stimulate more work. And I think um, that's the, the one other thing that is important to think about for this handbook is that normally articles in a handbook are expected to provide an overview of the situation. What has been written on the topic? How, did the, how has the topic developed over a generation or over two generations? Um, what, are the, what does one side say? What does another side say? What does another side say? And here we have topics and articles that are almost the first in the field, certainly the first one in the Italian background, for instance, like the, the article from Johanna Monti on machine translation. How many other people have written on that? Here's the one very early article. So there's no question of producing an overview. Uh, many of these texts are not overview articles. And that's really a case in point as well for some of the Middle Eastern texts from, from Egypt, the one that is so, so uh, interesting on the on the topic of uh, cleaning product labels 
the translation of cleaning product labels into Arabic, which systematically feminize the operator of the cleaning material, and therefore make cleaning imply or create the impression that cleaning is a female activity and so on. Those, those are just, yeah, individual pieces that, that I found very, yeah, stark, interesting, and way beyond anything that I had read before because I was very much focused on, on literature and on, on literary texts. And uh, yeah, they've brought up interesting and new directions. Another new direction, not so new, but, but still very much in development and really important is media translation. So translation in audiovisual um, moments where we have one article by uh, Irene Ranzato from Italy, but much more work could be done and should be done. Um, yeah, so very much, um, very much, I hope, an inspirational book where people can see, ah, oh, we need to work on this in our particular context. And this is an issue that hasn't been addressed enough in, in, yeah, in Brazil or in Argentina or in China or wherever. Yes, so um, for me, those were the, the really interesting uh, new things that we could bring. Um, briefly on the topic of English as a lingua franca, yes, it's a real pain. It is such a problem. And yeah, to publish with Rutledge and to publish this book with Rutledge and to bring all these uh, international and very diverse uh, experiences and ideas into a book on, on gender and translation was, is, a, is a privilege and is wonderful to be able to do. But yes, it would also be good if it were done in Arabic, if it were done in Chinese, if it were done in Spanish, if it were done in many of the other languages in, of, of the world and not assembled primarily or only in English. The other side of the coin, of course, is that uh, when you publish it in English, it can more easily be read in China, in India, in, in various parts of the world, because English has indeed become the lingua franca and uh, is relatively easy, is a relatively easy language to learn, to produce, to read, to understand, um, which may be one reason why it has become a lingua franca. Yeah, so those are, that's really what I have to say. I wrote out a lot of other material. I think maybe the most, the most important or the only other important thing is to maybe mention a few of the articles that I found was really happy to be able to include beyond those pragmatic ones that I mentioned. Um, we, we got an, uh, such an interesting text from, from uh, Rajkumar Elegedi or Elegedi, I don't know how to pronounce his name, on Volga, the translator who worked in the 1970s in, in India, working from English, from other European languages, from material that had been translated from Italian, I think translated into English and then translated by her, all into one of the Indian languages, Telugu. And Eligedi traces how this one woman translator who takes the name, the pen name of Volga, um, uses translation Bring these uh, feminine into very misogynist and responds to translating kind of, you know, the situation in Quebec in the late 1960s, so early 70s, same kind of period, out of which feminist translation developed, um, where, again, there was a revolution called the Quiet Revolution going on, very much a cultural and social uh, moment of change, 
And again, women of the same generation, same age, same education, being relegated or feeling that they were being relegated to the coffee machine and developing very, very experimental and feminist texts in response to the largely Marxist or even Maoist um, uh, texts and, and, and discourse that their male counterparts were producing. Um, so here we have a, another wonderful parallel from India. Then perhaps the text by Seema Sharifi uh, on The Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood, in Persian translation in Farsi, the question that she asks is how can such a text be past the censors in Iran? And what happens to it? How accessible is it? Uh, what actually does it say in Persian translation? And she shows how many, many different levels of censorship can be put in place and are put in place to allow the text to appear, to appear to appear, but in a, in, to appear in fact in quite different shape and form and hardly accessible. Then a whole group of women writing from Chile who had never uh, written or published very much that I'm aware of in translation studies. And for them, this was a, this was a first. Um, and I should say that the article looks at something that's really interesting again. And, and for those of us working from the Anglo-American European angle um, are not necessarily aware of, and that is that there are, <laughs> or they point out in the article, there are three aspects to women's lives which need careful translation when you're translating out of Chile or out of South America, perhaps more broadly. And one of them is the role and the impact and the literary uh, material around the indigenous live-in nanny who, who, who becomes part of the family, who plays an incredibly important role and comes up regularly in certain women's texts and needs proper recognition and proper, um, yeah, proper translation, detailed, careful translation into those other languages and cultures where indigenous live-in nannies do not exist. And, and the, the, the emotional and psychological and, and even traditional aspect of that is hard to hard to understand. So um, there are other aspects, of course, the power of the Catholic Church in in that area, and then the question of women's hair, <laughs> women's looks more broadly, but women's hair specifically. Uh, 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 material, you know, issues that that I had not ever encountered so directly or thought about. So superbly interesting and I should say that this article has already moved on and mobilized uh, someone working in Sweden, Cecilia Alvstad, who is at, this, at Stockholm University and is delving further into those particular women writers because she read the article in the handbook and is developing work for another handbook um, being put together on um, translation from Hispanic cultures into English, I believe, I'm not sure exactly. Denise Pripper is, is co-editing and she's here with us somewhere. She can talk about it. Yeah, so lots of, I think, I think the diversity, the international aspect of it and the huge learning curve that I went through and that I'm sure Hala went through as well, um, when all of these very diverse um, issues that feminist translation comes up again or feminist comes up against or that feminist translators come up against or that people doing feminist translation studies come up against um, have brought to the fore in the book that we were able to put together. So that's what I have to say. I'm happy to answer lots of questions. Um, yeah, that's it. Is anyone still there? Yes, we, we are all here. I think Hala, if, if um, Hala wants to complement something you've, you've said, 
um, or maybe disagree with you, who knows? <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is Hala's turn now. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for organizing this webinar, and I'm uh, very pleased to to be here with you and um, to see that so many people have joined. Uh, among whom I can see also some of the contributors. I'm also happy to see Hala mm -hmm. um, Semi, my colleague from Cairo, uh, here with us um, as well, and. Um, um, uh, uh, Nihad, I suppose. So, you know, uh, there, there are also, you know, people from Istanbul, etc. Just to, to add to, um, to Louise's point, um, before I begin about uh, the, um, the, the beginnings, we didn't manage to find um, uh, anybody to write from Sub-Saharan Africa, nor from Australia. You remember the effort that we made trying to identify someone and we couldn't? So, um, and so actually uh, the beginnings the beginnings uh, were in Kielce when um, I had heard of this conference on women and translation and um, because I do not come from um, a specialization in translation so uh, my university wouldn't support my trip to Poland to attend such a conference but I, I presented uh, submitted a presentation on um, uh, my work uh, as a translator uh, of women's texts and I, my abstract was accepted. So I went because Louise was the keynote speaker. And this was our first, uh, our first communication. Then this was 2015, I think. And then in 2016, um, I came across the Routledge um, uh, interest in having a volume, this handbook, translation and this is when I contacted uh, Louise. So this was tw 2016 and uh, I, I reminded her of myself and it so happened that she was, it was during the summer so she was traveling in Europe and she said okay I I'll come to Cairo and meet you. And she came just for a few days, it was a very short visit and uh, it was the first time that we started talking about the possibility of a book because then we would go ahead with the proposal and the conceptualization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll share with you uh, my screen now because I have, um, um, right, I have here some uh, of those uh, points that I would like to uh, highlight as I uh, talk to you. Let me see how this works. Um, as I mentioned before, I do not come from a background um, in translation studies. We don't have translation studies as a specialization um, at uh, Cairo University nor at any of the Egyptian universities. At, at least we didn't have until we established the MA in the politics of translation at Cairo University a few years ago. Um, translation is always done. People working on thesis in translation do them uh, under linguistics and in uh, departments of languages we have this very clear distinction between the literature people and the linguistics people. So I belong to the uh, literature people. Uh, my specialization is um, uh, women's autobiographies, women's life writing, etc. However, I started very early on because of my interest particularly in feminism, I started um, uh, to translate uh, feminist thought into Arabic. And these are examples of the books that I translated. Uh, Layla Ahmed's uh, Women and Gender in Islam, uh, Judith Tucker's Women in 19th Century Egypt, um, a collection of proverbs from all over the world, Never Marry a Woman with Big Feet, um, uh, Feminist Research Practice. So these books have all been translated into Arabic. I translated them. The first I did in 1999. Uh, at a very early stage in my academic uh, career. And this was at the side because, as I said, I am located within uh, literature. Um, um, uh, then I, uh, I translated two uh, volumes of articles that were not published as such. Uh, the, the top one is Aswad Badila, meaning alternative voices. This was a collection made by my colleague uh, Huda Issadda, and then another one that I collected uh, and translated uh, uh, feminist literary criticism. The idea behind this is to present feminist uh, thought uh, in uh, Arabic language to encourage people, young scholars in particular, to read, to be exposed, to have access to this kind of knowledge produced on feminism, uh, gender, uh, uh, across the disciplines, and then encourage them to, um, to start producing 
uh, knowledge that is more connected to our own uh, culture, to offer readings of, um, uh, of Arabic uh, culture and uh, thought uh, from a feminist perspective. Um, I also translated um, a, a book into English, Masirat uh, al-Mar al-Masriya, Significant Moments in the History of Egyptian Women. And uh, my latest uh, about to come out is, uh, again, Huda Sada's Gender, Nation, and the Arabic Novel, which I translated into uh, Arabic. So this is the area uh, where I do translation that um, doesn't count. Because when I, when I submit my work for promotion, and this is something facing, again, my colleague here, Hala Semi, we have this problem that this kind of work is not counted as, um, as academic work. It is counted as nashat um, uh, meaning uh, cultural, uh, cultural uh, interest, cultural, intellectual <coughs> activity and so on. Um, <clears throat> however, um, um, these are, this is a series, the, this is a series on feminist translation and this is the really the real project of feminist translation which I worked on and um, it is part of the Women in Memory Forum, which is a non-government organization, a, a research center, a feminist research center uh, in Cairo um, and this is one Yes, it seems by reading the chat, it seems there are some problems maybe with the connection. Um, uh, we cannot hear Hala. We yeah, don't know okay. if Hala can hear us. Maybe some of the organizers want to. Yes, I think something. that Hala um, is not here anymore. So I'm going to try to write her an email uh, to know uh, if she can reconnect to the, to the Zoom platform. Um, and I'm just asking everybody to be patient and uh, I hope she will soon be back. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's it's probably a glitch or something and it's caused probably the, the connection to um, to go right. So she's probably going to reconnect. we we'll try to reconnect pretty soon. Uh, hopefully. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, um, Olga, you say you I'm feel I'm free to step in. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a private message to you, but that's absolutely fine. Yeah, I didn't want to force anything, so I was just thinking because this webinar is being recorded, yeah. so that um, rather than mm -hmm, rather yeah, than when have we a wait, big long blank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a few more things that I can say and that I, I, I would love to discuss with, with others and who are listening. 
uh, one around the problem of, of English as a lingua franca. And then you also asked the question of how did we select articles and how did we select abstracts and so on. Um, I don't remember exactly how we selected the abstracts, but we, we basically have to, when, when you put together a book in English, you have to be able to understand the structure and a main idea that the abstract is proposing to then create an article around. And so one of the really, really um, challenging issues here was that 36 of the, artic of the 41 articles in this book were written by people who do not have English as a first language. So this means that 36 articles have to be written either in someone's second language or someone's third language, and then and then edited, and then uh, sometimes there were quite strong structural changes that that we asked for and that I asked for often because I ended up being the the anglophone, the resident anglophone who's supposed to know everything, and this was really quite difficult and also difficult to negotiate with with writers as an author you don't necessarily appreciate uh when some editor comes in and and tells you asks you politely to change certain things in your text and so on so it, it that is a really really difficult aspect of uh of publishing in english that maybe maybe we when we kind of disrespect or when we criticize the fact that so much is published in English, we can also think about the role of the poor editor who's trying to make sure that it is as readable as possible in English. And yes, you're right. There are lots of conventions and traditions of writing that are specific to English, the English essay, for instance, that may be quite different in, in, in French, in Italian, in Spanish, let alone you know, farther afield uh, in Chinese, for instance, or in, in Hindi. And yes, so everything has to change for those 36 people who are writing essays in English. Uh, very complicated and very much a long-term back and forth collaborative effort. In regard to translating academic work, that, which Olga suggested, is that an alternative, that, that we publish, uh, that these works be published in Spanish, in Arabic, in uh, Italian, or in Chinese, and then translated? Yes, yes, good, good idea. However, that requires a lot of money, it requires another entire publishing house, or a publishing venture where you have it online. Um, it also requires a lot of understanding. And I have to refer you to a text that came from Poland that's in this handbook by Eva Kraskowska and uh, Veronika Schweps, who write about, who study the translation of Judith Butler, maybe Beauvoir, I can't remember, three particular um, authors into Polish and show how the translations, and Tatiana Bartinova as well looks at that, the translations into Russian of these materials and shows how uh, tricky the job of translation is. And the translators, which Bartinova describes as naive in the 1990s, who suddenly take over uh, as, as the capitalist economy kicks in, um, and who translate in French, you would say n'importe quoi. They don't have a word for empowerment to translate you know, North American feminist material into Russian. Sorry, there's no such word as empowerment in Russian, so we cannot do it. And, and so the, the translations are not necessarily always the answer. Um, yeah, I see Hala is back. Hello, Hala, what happened? <laughs> Well, I don't know what happened, but probably it's because I I said um, um, uh, I said uh, politically incorrect words such as uh, uh, C I V I L uh, S O C I E T Y and uh, you know and so on. That this is where um, uh, this is where feminism uh, is developing, not within academia. But anyway, 
Um, now to go back very quickly, yeah. and I will just move on to uh, to the to the um, uh, to the handbook. Mm -hmm. um, with the handbook, um, as we said um, uh, earlier, we met in uh, Poland. It's gone again. Um, I'm going to write to her again. I'm sorry. I think it's uh, something to do with the with the screen presentation. Yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe. So I'm going to write again, um, and I, I hope she'll be back very soon. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, do not hesitate to to speak, you know, dear Louise. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll go on because I wrote I wrote about three or four pages of things that could be discussed or that I could talk about. Um, I think I think one of the other interesting questions that came up was what or, or that was um, posed in one of these articles was the question of interpretation. Um, there has been relatively little work on topics that connect feminism and feminist and gender aware uh, ideas with interpretation, with simultaneous interpretation and consecutive interpretation. And this one article that we got from Jade Du um, puts a very interesting spin on the topic where you have, uh, a, and, and it produces a study of an interpreter, and then therefore interpretation more, more broadly, a uh, consecutive interpreter working in China, working next to uh, well-known politicians and important figures and very gifted uh, linguists apparently, who however is not so much admired for her linguistic um, pizzazz and, and abilities, but for her looks for what she's wearing, for how her hair is, the tone of her skin, her behavior, nice and modest as she shows up uh, behind the behind whichever uh, dignitary uh, she's working for, and how the, the cultural aspects or the cultural requirements for a woman doing such a job are possibly quite different for than they would be for a male interpreter doing the same consecutive interpreting and therefore being on screen, being visible and being, you know, behind the right shoulder or the left shoulder of whoever they're working for. So it's, it's a really interesting study. There are many other studies that could be done on interpreting how, how uh, women interpreters and many, many women are in the business of simultaneous and consecutive interpreting, how they deal with language that is not respectful, say, or that is outright aggressive or outright demeaning. Um, I have tried to work on that and get very little traction. Um, people will just say, we are professionals. We interpret whatever is said. And there are many, many reasons why one can or should interpret whatever is said because it also reveals the use of language and the abuse of language, perhaps on the part of whoever you're interpreting for. However, there are lots of, um, lots of things to say about it, and I don't think enough has been said or written on that topic. So, Hala is back. Hala, are you back? Yes, I'm back. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, so now the points that Olga raised about selection um uh, we sent we sent the, the the call for papers out but there were regions that we knew that uh, we had to look for uh, participants for scholars actually 
uh, even encourage scholars who have not been doing work in the area of translation and feminism to, uh, to develop uh, work in this direction. And in that sense, as Louise has pointed out, the handbook is not a typical handbook where you have mostly a survey uh, essays. But um, most of the research uh, in this handbook is uh, original, is, um, um, has been developed specifically for the purpose of this uh, handbook. Now, to give you an example, of course, because I was, um, we also divided regions among the two of us. So um, I was responsible to try and identify uh, contributors from uh, the Middle East, from my part of the world, particularly in the Arab world. And I knew that that a feminist translation is not uh, is not um, taught. Uh, we do not have uh, any uh, scholars known as feminist translators. Um, actually, we are still very much behind when it comes to translation studies uh, uh, in academia, where they are still talking in terms of you know uh, equivalency and rather than you know uh, Venuti uh, foreignization. These are the areas that are still uh, dominating. Uh, uh, translation studies. So, um, um, uh, one example is Hala Semi, my colleague at Cairo University. Uh, Hala Semi speaks Arabic, English, French at the same level. Uh, she's fluent in the three languages. She um, has been doing a translation uh, on the side, not uh, academically. Again, she specialized in um, in. Uh, um, in literature, in the sense of fairy tales, uh, rewritten versions of fairy tales, feminist rewritings of fairy, fairy tales, and modern rewritings of fairy tales, and I, I approached Hella and I, I and I and I um, asked her whether she would be interested in uh, writing uh, an essay on uh, Simone de Beauvoir in Arabic. How Simone de Beauvoir has been translated into Arabic bearing in mind that um, Hala Sami uh, knows Arabic, English, and French, so she can look at the different uh, texts and see what has happened to Simone de Beauvoir when she was uh, represented in Arabic. Um, again, um, uh, we sent, I tried to uh, approach different um, um, uh, academics, uh, for instance, at the American University uh, in Cairo, uh, private universities where they have translation um, uh, departments such as the MIU, uh, Miss University, where Sama Daoud wrote this article on the cleaning products, the translation, she's a linguist. Um, so again, for the first time, she was writing a feminist paper in the sense that um, uh, her interest in uh, a feminist approach to translation was developed through this uh, project. The same applies to uh, other areas. I was trying to identify uh, scholars in different uh, parts of the Arab world. Um, uh, I approached people at the AUB American University in Beirut. Uh, we had two who said that they would be willing to help us with the reviewing process, but uh, they wouldn't be able to produce work because it required research. As I said, you know, this is an area that has not been um, previously researched in, in Arabic and therefore everybody was rather um, um, apprehensive of the idea of, you know, uh, um, uh, taking a shift in their research uh, interest to work on uh, this uh, essay. Hala, I think you are muted. Uh, we can see you now, but could you please okay. unmute yourself? Yes. Yeah. So uh, this is how we identified the um, the, the the scholar uh, working uh, on the Kuwaiti document, right? The terminology. Um, <clears throat> uh, but then she couldn't she couldn't commit uh, uh, to to the chapter. Um, I'm going to intervene here where while while Hala comes back online. If, is that okay, Olga? Yes, absolutely. Yes, feel free. Because what something she said really, really struck me, and that is that she did a lot of work reaching out to people 
asking them to write something on a feminist topic, which they had not so far researched and which would mean a new research direction for them. And some of them engaged and some didn't, couldn't or didn't. And one of the problems that I see in that and that I saw throughout the, the uh, handbook is that we have lots of new material, new authors writing on this material, but old theory in a way. And old theory, which dates from the 1980s, 1990s, um, and ha may not have advanced enough. So you get the same references to my work, to work by Sherry Simon, uh, to work by, yeah, by Venuti and company. And, and it, uh, those are, are, are the solid Anglophone, Anglo-American, European references, which are now um, spreading and being spread by young scholars because they look for material that, that they can base their work on, having not done such work or been asked to do such work before. And so it's, uh, it's an interesting problem uh, that, that um, I wonder whether, whether it can be diverted a little bit, whether new material, specific theoretical material to the Middle East or specific material or material specific to China or to India can be mobilized or to South America can be mobilized and not, and so not have only Anglo-American and European um, academic references in the work. That's, that was one thing that, that I thought, oh, not again, you know, here we have again the Quebec feminists and their, their um, English translators producing feminist translation dating from the 1970s and applying to uh, Egypt in 2020 or in, 20, in 2015, 16, 17. I think that's a really, that's an interesting problem that I felt very strongly came up very often in the articles. Hello, back. Yes, I now, um, one of the challenges I think that we faced, um, uh, we completely relied on Louise when it comes to uh, the final editing because uh, she was the native, uh, the native speaker. Um, however, um, uh, I told Louise that I would handle, because this is something that I do, of course, uh, with my students, um, uh, since I deal mostly with uh, non-native second I, uh, students of English as second language, uh, which is uh, trying to help develop the academic discourse because it's not only that we come uh, as authors, uh, contributors to the volume from different um, from different disciplines, as I pointed out, you know, uh, there's this variety and what brought us together was the translation, feminism and gender with different, um, with different stresses. Some are more into translations, other are more into feminism uh, and uh, gender studies. Um, but um, one of the important things was, for instance, uh, with writers from Egypt, um, from India, um, uh, from different parts of the world, uh, was for me to work with them towards not only the requirement of uh, Routledge, because Routledge had um, a kind of a, 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 I wouldn't say a template, but they wanted every uh, chapter to include a historical section, a critical section, and uh, a kind of an either a case study or um, an analytical part. So um, not all writers are trained to uh, write in accordance with uh, what we call here uh, Western uh, requirements, academic uh, writing. So step by step, even with um, with with with, uh, I think with the text coming from a text coming from Italy and other from different kinds of the world. It's not just about the Arab world where we have this issue about uh, academic discourse, turning those um, essays to fit the criteria. Uh, set by Routledge, which I know are part of academic discourse, because this is why many of us um, have a hard time uh, publishing uh, in Western journals, because we write differently, because our um, uh, style, uh, uh, our structures uh, are, um, are, are different. 
in the sense of uh, not only, you know, uh, things related to citation, etc., but even um, how to present previous work and then how to reflect on this previous work and then how to uh, present your own uh, take on uh, all of that. So uh, this was, this was, uh, this was, um, I think, uh, a stage in the editing process that I didn't anticipate, but uh, it took some uh, effort. And then there was the the added uh, eye, uh, Louise's eye, because we had we had our own eyes, and then we had the routage requirements, and then we had Louise's, you know, final uh, kind of um, I would say the quality control uh, uh, stamp at the end, and the the hard work that she put into uh, the language English, because uh, even with the help of our assistants, mostly uh, they were uh, Louise's assistants. Um, the assistants were not uh, trained to do uh, this kind of work. So um, the, the issue of the lingua franca is actually very broad. It's not just about um, uh, uh, knowledge produced in English, but it's also about uh, the way it is produced, the way it is uh, then uh, disseminated. And uh, why, not, why not produce this kind of work in Arabic? Um, I don't see um, I don't see enough research in Arabic at this stage that would uh, provide uh, such a piece of work. Even if I think now at this moment of having this volume translated into Arabic, who would translate it? It is so specialized that you need specialized translators who are familiar with translation studies, number one, not to mention, of course, the proficiency in languages, but they have to have the, 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 they have to have knowledge in translation studies. They have to have the knowledge in feminism because another issue connected to this is terminology. And this is another point that we discussed, um, the use of terms and um, uh, 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 feminism, uh, gender, queer, uh, all of these have been touched upon by some of the contributors. Um, now, now, to go back to a point uh, mentioned by Olga, raised actually a question, what is the section that I would have liked to see in this handbook, but I don't see it yet, maybe it could be a book project, is to trace the, the Um, while we wait for Hala, uh -huh. yeah, Louise, what is, I mean, I'm, I'm directing the question to you now. Yeah. What is it that you would like to see in the handbook that it's not there for whatever reason? What I would have liked to see in the handbook and what is not there, I think we need a, a, a book on sub-Saharan African um, feminist approaches to writing and to translation. I think that would be a really, really interesting thing. I think we need an update of that kind of work also coming from India in various languages. We've heard of Telugu as one of the languages. Hindi is one of the languages that's discussed in the, in the article by, uh, by uh, Bakshi and Upadhyaya. I can always have a hard time with his name, Upadhyaya. Um, but, but very specific places. And it would be such an excellent and interesting idea to, to be able to do such books or such collection of articles by geographical or, yeah, geographical, geopolitical contexts where right now we have this amazing uh, jumble, international or transnational jumble uh, of, of, of material here that we've tried to organize into segments and sections, but I think it would also make a lot of sense to be a little bit more specific. Um, Hala's back. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry about now, that. Hala, I can't, yeah, tell us. I'm very sorry. I, I'm, I really, I can't help it. I know what's wrong. 
<laughs> That's all right. Them. So we were just very excited to find out, you know, what was that you would like to see or to have in the, in the handbook. Could you tell us now? Yes, yes. It's a, um, a section that deals with terminology. Um, the, the, the terms feminism, gender, queer, and their transnational journeys across different countries because every term of these has its own history. I've tried to trace um, the journey of feminism and gender in Arabic, the way that the term itself uh, has developed and how it has been translated. So feminism has not been translated in Arabic. It existed with the first wave of the feminists. They, the term that they used has been then used by us, by my generation to translate the term feminism. Uh, but the term gender, for instance, has a completely different uh, history because it came here in the late 80s and 90s with, uh, with the development projects, basically, uh, not with the history of a feminist movement. So it has a completely different history. Now, all the young groups that are working um, with LGBT uh, rights and, uh, and, um, and uh, queer uh, identity, identified uh, young people, again, the term queer, for instance, has a very interesting uh, history when it comes to uh, Arabic. So um, I know that the, his similar histories might be also, uh, are probably also uh, present uh, in Poland, um, in China, because the way that these concepts travel, the way that these um, uh, theories travel, as Edward Said alerted us, um, is a process that leads to a transformation in the terms themselves when they move from one culture to another. And um, this is a part that I would have liked to see, but uh, we did not get any papers around or any chapters in this direction. And we already had ma a massive amount of, um, of uh, material that we had to work our way uh, through. Um, the last point that I wanted to uh, reflect on that was uh, pointed out uh, by um, Olga has to do with the price. Of course, the price is something incredible. I must tell you that the price of this volume is uh, uh, is almost, um, how much is it? It's about $200. Uh, Dollars. Exactly. So $200, that's uh, times, um, that's that's half my monthly salary. So it's impossible. Our universities won't buy the books. So what I did was actually, because of the corona, I wasn't even sure that my complimentary copies would reach me here. So I asked for a PDF instead of the, of the, of the, of the hard copy. I then got one because it was sent to a friend of mine who lives in London. And then uh, she brought it uh, when she came here. Um, uh, so I have I have my hard copy, but um, the issue of prices is something uh, else. Uh, what I did was I approached Taylor and Francis and I asked them, "What can you do for us in our region?" Uh, and I think this is something that people in different regions should try to again investigate because they told me a solution. They told me that Taylor and Francis have a branch in Cairo, a recently opened one, immediately before Corona, so they didn't manage to do much work. But uh, what they do is that they bring their publications to the Cairo Book Fair and they sell them at almost 50% uh, reduction. So we but, are now waiting for the Cairo uh, Book Fair if it takes place in January. But still, um, it's one quarter of your salary. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, my salary, it's 8,000 Egyptian pounds. That's uh, yeah, 200. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, I mean, even if it's half price, it's still very it is, expensive. Of course, of course, nobody would buy it. Nobody would buy it. And universities, uh, as I said, translation and this kind of work is not, uh, wouldn't be at the top of their uh, priorities, especially that now they are more concerned with COVID research and nanotechnology than they would be interested in translation, feminism and gender, of course. So if I even recommend what I'm counting on is I'm counting on uh, being able to get another copy of the book to be, uh, to make it available in our department library. But uh, I know that this is not the case with my university alone, and it's not only the case with Egypt, because we know from our colleagues in Latin America. And um, I am not sure whether the way out is to stop publishing with people like Routledge. I think uh, it's to negotiate uh, uh, arrangements that are more uh, considerate of 
other parts of the world. And uh, Taylor and Francis uh, said that they would be willing to look into such possibilities. Uh, of course, uh, they recommended the e-books, um, but still, of course, um, I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have an answer. Um, it is, it is, it is, it is part of uh, the world we live in. Uh, in Egypt, I would have the choice to uh, translate and publish uh, my book with a private publishing house, where I would be paid, uh, say, fifty thousand pounds for a book. Uh, a translation, but I opt, I translate, all my translations are done for the National Translation Center. I get less than 50% of what I would have got as a translator in a private, um, uh, by, public, by, by a private publisher, but at least uh, the National Translation Center uh, sells books uh, much, much cheaper. Uh, so a book would cost about 20, 25 Egyptian pounds, which is the equivalent of, well, it would be the equivalent of 25 value value wise it would be the equivalent of 20 dollars but not 200 dollars i'm talking here about the equivalence of the, the 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 money not the exchange rate so um there are there are such choices that we need to take sometimes and i don't know whether it would be able, we would be able as uh, feminists working with translation to identify worldwide um, uh, publishing houses that would be prepared to uh, uh, to promote uh, uh, such work and promote it. And of course, I don't know, I don't know how much uh, a routage volume of these would cost the publisher, how much money they are making out of it. I, I, I have no idea. But um, uh, what I know is that this is definitely not uh, possible. Uh, it adds the gap, it widens the gap that you mentioned, Olga, at the beginning, uh, definitely. And our way to overcome it is to uh, ask permission to be able to share PDFs with our students, at least, uh, to ask for permission to be able to, um, to uh, share uh, parts of, these, uh, of the book uh, with other scholars interested in pursuing uh, this area. Um, Otherwise, it's it's very difficult. It's uh, we cannot count of, on our institutions to buy this book. We cannot count on it being uh, on sale in uh, library in in bookshops. We cannot uh, count on uh, academic even libraries to uh, buy them. So right. So that's that's uh, basically. I don't know whether it's time for us to open the floor for discussion. I don't know whether there is anything, Olga, that you would like me to reflect on. Um, Maybe, maybe one point I think that we haven't mentioned, Louise, is the meetings. We said that we met in June 2016 when you came for us to get to, you know, to meet and to talk about the possibility of us working on the book. But then Louise came again, uh, I have the dates, 2017. And uh, we managed to arrange through uh, Nihad uh, Mansour, who was here with us. I saw her name some, uh, a moment ago in the gallery. Um, uh, Nihad uh, at Alexandria University uh, organized a lecture uh, for Louise. So we went, uh, Louise came to Cairo and then we went together to Alexandria. Uh, we met Nihad and Doa, I think, also came to see you that day. Uh, Louise and um, uh, Louise gave a presentation uh, at university, Alexandria University. We had again a discussion. We were not yet halfway, but we had the bulk of uh, submissions. So we, we, we worked on them. And then, of course, I don't know whether I didn't see Eva, uh, uh, Eva Kraskowska here today. But Eva Kraskowska is again a uh, uh, University of Poznan in Poland, whom we uh, identified through uh, the internet. We had net, not met her before. I had not met her before. She wasn't there at the Kielce uh, conference. She's uh, uh, specialized in Polish literature, but also in uh, translation. And uh, I realized, uh, looking at her profile, that she's also the director of um, gender studies and translation studies. So I invited her to uh, submit a paper, um, a chapter, which she did, uh, the one that uh, Louise mentioned on the translation of A Room of One's Own, uh, Le Deuxième Sex and Gender Trouble into Polish. It's a joint paper with uh, Eva Schweppes. 
And she also recommended her colleague, Eva Rajewska, who did, did a, a very interesting, uh, what she calls a hair story of uh, Polish women translators. Um, Eva, because um, uh, this was a time when uh, she was, I think, directing her center, so she got uh, support, university support, and we had a big meeting in Poznań, halfway through the work in 2017, where um, uh, uh, they offered us accommodation and we had to manage our flights. And I must, I must also point out that uh, our universities do not support us. So in our case, we managed uh, Doha, um, uh, Nihad and myself, we went to Poznan, but we know that there are other colleagues from Egyptian University, from the Arab region and from South America who could not get funding and therefore did not manage to go. Eli Gedi from uh, India did not, the one who wrote this uh, interesting chapter on Volga, um, the, 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 the Telugu translator. Uh, but there were about, I don't remember the exact number, but there were about maybe 20 uh, of us there in Poznan where we worked for three days, working, presenting our work, trying to identify um, areas, similarities, differences. And I think based on this meeting, uh, Louise and I managed to uh, conceptualize the division because by then we did not have yet the structure of the book. But I think that meeting was extremely helpful in, uh, in helping us uh, uh, work out a kind of a structure of the book based on uh, the contributors' uh, presentations. Because after all, we were getting the actual papers um, uh, 2018, I think, was the deadline uh, for submission. So this is about the this is about uh, a, a bit of the the the, the process as well. Um, now uh, I don't know whether Olga whether you have any questions that uh, I haven't uh, reflected on or responded to that you would like to um, to alert me to. Uh, yeah, I uh, yeah I think you have covered uh, all of my questions really. So I'm 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 gonna because I'm I'm conscious of time. I'm gonna ask. Heloise, if she wants to um, to make some brief announcements about how the discussion is going to work, and then I may ask just a couple of questions to both Louise and you. Thank you, Olga. So yeah, if we're now we're gonna go into the Q and A section. Um, so just as a reminder to everyone here, there are two ways to ask your questions. Either you can ask them in the chat section of the window here, um, either to everyone or to me directly, and I will um, make sure to you know make a note of your question so it can be asked to the presenters, or you can raise your hand. Um, Samantha will take care of that um, and making sure each time that you know you get to ask your question. If you're raising your hand, then you will be asked to unmute your mic, um, turn your camera on if that's what you want, and ask your question to the presenters directly. Um, so yeah, we're going to proceed to the Q and A section now. I'm really, really excited to see what you know everyone else has um, to say about all this and all the lovely questions I'm sure you're going to get. Right, can you, can you see me now? Is my camera on? Yeah, brilliant, okay. Perfect. So first of all, thank you, thank you Louise and Halle for such an insightful presentation and insightful discussion. I am really, really impressed that you have covered all my themes, all my questions. And of course, as I was listening, I was also taking notes um, as I'm sure most of the participants were doing as well. Many new ideas for new projects, but I don't want to steal more time really so that participants can, can ask their questions. So I just have three quick um, um, topics or questions that I would like to, to ask, but feel free just to, uh, to get back to them at, at the end if you want or to answer them as you go uh, along with the other questions. So the first thing is about feminism and translation being an interdisciplinary uh, field. Um, it connects to traditional, maybe not too much traditional, but at least to different areas, translation studies and, and gender studies, feminist studies, etc., with uh, different traditions, um, with different tools, uh, with scholars doing uh, different readings as well. 
And actually, in your introduction to the handbook, you said, and uh, page one, and I quote, one of the aims of the handbook is to encourage the development of scholarly interest, both, one, among colleagues already working in the area of translation studies, so translation studies departments, urging them to adopt feminist approaches and gender tools, and, number two, among feminist literary and social critics, so working in feminist theory departments, whom we invited to address the questions of translation, end of quote. So you were saying that um, uh, you received a lot of, uh, of interest or a, a very good response from uh, younger academics. My question is, was there a balance between the number of academics coming from translation studies departments and gender women studies departments? So that's the first question. Second question, when I asked you about, um, well, what topic do you, uh, do you would like to, to, to see in the handbook that is not there, Hala said a section on terminology. And I agree, that would be absolutely great. So building on that, and also uh, bearing in mind that there is a specific section on feminism, gender, and queer in translation, my question, thorny topic perhaps is, would you say queer translation studies are part of feminist translation studies? Should they be, or maybe not? And finally, a very general, generic question. How would you like to see the field of gender and feminist translation evolving in five years time? So those are my three um, questions. Feel free to address them as you prefer and, and then um, we can um, open the, the discussion and the debate to all the participants. Okay, Olga, I'm willing to speak to number one and perhaps a little bit number two. Number one being your question about whether abstracts, articles, and submissions came largely from translation studies academics or other. And I think the answer is clearly other. <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't a large number of translation studies departments as such. And I think um, the fact that so much came from, from literary studies and from linguistics um, is, yeah, is, is also indicative of what I, or, or is part of what I thought was maybe one of the problems that you've got new material and they reach back for old theory, old theory that's 40 years old dates from 1970s and is, is accessible. And when you try to put together feminism and translation books, there are two or three main people and you read them and then that's enough. But what about the local? What about the local aspects? I think I, I've heard talks myself where, where people comment on the fact that the power of English academia in the 70s and 80s determining what is post-colonialism, what is feminism, what is, what is queer, what is gender and so on, has wiped out questions on that topic in more local contexts. So that the Anglo-American and, and European approaches to those questions through the dominance of their academic institutions um, have determined what exactly those terms mean and hence, I think Hala is right that it would be really sharp to have a few um, articles on the history of those terms. Gender, for instance, oh man, gender alone, translating it into German, where for years and years it was just gender. <laughs> there was no translation because it was such a foreign word, such a foreign topic, such a, it was just left in the English language. And I'm sure that's the case in many places because there's no one word translation for it, right? But there are, it's translatable and it has to be adapted. It has to be adapted to the local uh, situations, I think. So yeah, 
that's my response to your first and second question. Evolution of the field, bubbling, <laughs> growing. And it's very good from Brazil, from, from Argentina, from Chile, from Mexico, from Turkey, from India. It's fantastic. And in China as well, as much as people can produce in that topic on that topic in China. So yeah, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, we're still waiting to hear. Yeah, or I am still waiting to hear. So that's uh, yeah. what I have to say on those topics. Yeah, yeah, right. Hala, would you like to say something yeah, else and maybe touch upon the question of queer? queer? The point about queer, you asked whether we consider queer as part of gender. Now with mm. queer, there was an issue because um, we wanted to include, we decided that we're not going to exclude queer from this, uh, from this uh, handbook. However, uh, I think a year after we had started, uh, uh, Routledge were, had someone, and Louise knows more details than I do about it, had someone work on the handbook of translation and queer, right? And sexuality, and I think. Some of our, they wanted, it was, uh, the idea was that they wanted one or two of our uh, essays to go into that one and we decided to hold on to you know to 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 those but yes to answer your question yes we wanted this wider umbrella we wanted to not just of course both of us i think we are more grounded in feminism our approach is definitely ideologically uh, uh, oriented and there is a bit in my case also a bit of a connection to um, uh, what Louise calls intervention ac activism uh, when it comes to uh, so we're not just gender in the sense of uh, analytical tool etc perspective and queer was part of this we, we we thought that we cannot exclude queer it wasn't about including queer as much as we're not going to exclude papers essays that come to us focusing on on queer. I don't know whether Louise you would like to add something because you remember perhaps the details. No, I prefer not to spill those beans. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, of course the reason why I was asking that question is because I've had discussions with colleagues who work in queer translation studies who argue that they feel not comfortable with the with the label feminist and so i thought well that's the, a great opportunity for me to ask louise and hala how they went um, about it um, you may remember louise when we put together a proposal for the uh, european translation studies conference in yeah. stalenbosch that was in last year 2019 it was specifically aimed or, or targeted at queer and feminist and we had no response about queer. <laughs> Just one, one proposal, I think. So yeah, that was, that was the, the, the story behind my, my question. Yeah. All right, okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to open the discussion now. So maybe uh, Heloise and Sam, would you like to start asking questions um, to, the, to the speakers? Um, um, yes, I have a question. Yeah, sure. I have there is one question here. Um, Sam, do you have, how many people do you have raising their I hands? I have nobody for, for now. Okay. Um, I do have you want to go a first and ask Sarah G. Sarah G is asking for. All right. Sarah G, can you open your, your micro? Uh, you yes, I can. Sorry, I wasn't sure whether Olga just transferred the floor to you. Do you want to ask your questions for Sam and Eliwas? No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Shebnam Susam Sarayeva. Uh, Louise and Olga, very nice to see you here again. Yes, nice to see you. Um, thank you very much for the talk. And uh, as someone who had just submitted another handbook to Routledge last week, uh, <laughs> I feel equally guilty, so to say. Uh, I think Luciana is somewhere here. We had a joint uh, article with her. I've seen her name. Anyway, I'm just very quick contribution, really. I, I think that we are still trying to think in the old lines. Uh, if, if, if we learned anything by this pandemic is, I think, you know, events like this can be done without the constraints of conferences, without the constraints of having everybody in somewhere. I, I think that that kind of thinking can and should be 
translated into the publication environment? I don't have an answer to it. I don't know how to do it, but I feel like we are still thinking in terms of, you know, for the academics in the UK, Olga, you are very familiar. We are still thinking in the terms of REF, what do we submit for REF, which journal is the most, you know, prestigious and things like that. But nobody is stopping us to come up, you know, beyond that, in addition to that, nobody is actually stopping us to share our research with the younger researchers using alternative platforms, because we still have copyright of our own publications to an extent, as long as we don't share the whole thing. So I'm, I'm particularly worried about the same issue Louise was raising. Yes, contributions coming from all around the world, but still using what Louise terms as the old theory. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to think about how we can bring the new theory to younger researchers without having recourse to physical books, PDFs, if, if that will be an issue with the publishers, any alternative means of reaching out to younger researchers using the online platforms we do have. That's, I think, all I have to say. Thank mm -hmm. you. Louise, would you like to say something? Well, it seems to me that Félicité is doing exactly that. And, and that it's a really um, solid, uh, so they have a really solid program set up for the next two weeks. Presumably, everyone can sign in. It would make some sense for another uh, operation to set up such a thing, for an English language operation to set up such a thing. It would be... In, yeah, and to collaborate at that level um, internationally, which yeah is not going to happen soon in person. So yeah, it's a very good idea. And then it requires also making fuss at university level to say, this is work that we're doing. This is academic work. And this requires also recognition in, in the places where you know they count how many words you've published in, in a month or how many articles you've published in a year. This uh, oral kind of community work is also academic work and should also count if we're among the bean counters of the world. Yeah. So yes, Olga, anytime you want to set up something at, at Warwick, I'm with you. <laughs> now, I was just nodding because I basically agree with both of you. Just very quickly to say that, well, a while ago, um, with the Meg Ergun, I created, we created this um, uh, feminist translation studies mailing list. Mm -hmm. So we are using English as a, as a language of um, communication. But um, we always encourage, I mean, it's, it's free to, to, to become a member. And we always encourage everybody to um, to share news about publications in any language because obviously we cannot read all the languages but at least we know oh a lot of work is being done in Lithuania or in, in you know in uh, in Latvian um, languages that I don't speak I won't be able to read but it, it helps um, see the bigger picture and to realize that it's not all about the anglophone uh, francophone, um, Hispanic world, but many other things are being done in in smaller languages as well. So anyone, if you want to, if you want to join the mailing list, email Sam or Heloise, and of course you will be very welcome. And now I shut up. Now everybody is welcome. I have uh, two other questions here from Caroline Shred and uh, 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 Eli Judy. Uh, first, do the question that I received a while ago. Um, yes. So that you know, we you know, switch back and forth between you. Um, so uh, I got. So one of the first questions I got was from Junior Kasongo, um, who said, "As a man doing feminist research in my PhD project, I don't see many men doing the same. How uh, does the panel think we could do to attract more men into feminist research?" Um, so yeah, any thoughts about that? Nobody wants to break their eyes, Louise. Hala. It's it's a good question. Um, I don't know. Is it the job of the professor to attract men into their research area? I don't know. I have a I have an MA student now, a young man, who is uh, is 
variously identified um, who is working on a feminist topic or a topic that could be is at least partially feminist. Um, it is such, I think it is a very individual and subjective decision that people make in to go into feminist research. Also, also it is, um, it is strategic and strategic depending on the context that you're in and whether or not you get you can publish the work that you produce and so on. So it's, it, I don't think it has to do necessarily with male and female uh, identities, but with all kinds of very subjective questions that, that come up. Also with, the, also with the, the relationship with the supervisor, even locating a supervisor that is willing to, to um, support you. Um, but then strategy, academic strategy is important, is important and cannot be forgotten. Hi, Carolyn. <laughs> That's my comment. So yeah, go, you can go, uh, Caroline and uh, Rajkumar, you can go ahead uh, for your questions, please. Yes, thank you. So nice to be here and, and such a fascinating discussion. It's nice to see everyone here. And I just really wanted to voice a wish. Um, I know that change often starts from that. Uh, and so while I'm listening to this conversation and, and to this really pressing issue of how do we do translation studies that is truly international and uh, committed to that? I mean, there's a sort of irony around this that we're all recognizing. And so the, the wish that, I'm, that I'd like to share would just be a publication which would uh, publish work in every different language, along with, okay, let's recognize the power of English, a translation into English. So it works written originally in those different languages, a translation into English, and then a translator's commentary on that process. So it would be a kind of performative piece that would put into practice what we're, and, and would be uh, reflecting on exactly these questions that we are doing. So it would be doing the work that we are wanting. It would also pr uh, pr create a new model for publishing essentially because uh, multilingual works, I can think of some, I know there's a, um, a, a book that was published, uh, let me think, wait a second, uh, in both English, French and Haitian Creole. Uh, it takes determination obviously. And I'm, I'm here, I'm, my wish is a, a much wider than that. Uh, you know, really, uh, let's say 25 different languages. 25 different languages, all with translation. I think that piece in itself would be doing what it's talking about, which has always been something that we've been interested in in feminist translation. So I'm just putting the wish out there because there's a lot of powerful people here uh, <laughs> who are all um, very creative. So, uh, and I'm sure there are other people who have had that same wish. So thank you. Gosh, very strategic. <laughs> Raj Kumar, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, uh, I mean, not exactly question. I just wanted to uh, say thanks to uh, Professor Luis and uh, Professor Hala for making this, uh, I think, wonderful project a reality. And I think this book, I hope it will uh, be a model for many researchers uh, to, you know, use as a resource for their work. Because when I started my work, I think it was uh, Professor Luis's work. Uh, translating in the area of feminism. That's where I started and uh, that was the model for me to work on my PhD. So I think uh, this, I'm sure this work, this uh, present work will also give a uh, inspiration to many scholars who want to work in this area. And uh, I was just thinking like, you know, when I started working in my PhD, uh, there was always this question from many students like, you know, what is the future of a PhD scholar? So, I mean, in translation studies, so that went on. And then when I finished my PhD, I was looking for uh, uh, positions and all. So the problem is, I think there are very few departments like in place like in India that I come from where uh, translation studies is taught. And, uh, but there is a lot of work going outside the department of translation studies, like uh, there is practical translation. Mm where there is an employment opportunities for people to work and make some, you know, living. So somewhere I feel that there is a, I mean, if you look at the departments in the universities, 
and outside the translation practice that happens. I think that is where the feminist translation practice is also coming from, where they publish stories and uh, where they publish uh, articles and all. So somewhere I think what I feel is that the the economics of translation is somewhere I think it is discouraging the people to come into this field. I mean, whether it is a as a translator or as a translator uh, a professor, I mean, to teach in the university. Somewhere this is the experience of many I think academicians in India, especially those who work in the translation or the translation field. So those who are doing some work between European languages and Indian languages, they are able to make some uh, out of it. But otherwise, somewhere I feel that how do you make it more sort of acceptable to the universities or the institutions where they can encourage more uh, translation studies teaching or translation studies publishing. So that is, I think, I mean, the problem is, again, this is because the, the, the department itself is very in the beginning stage now in India. We have only, I think, few departments. So I think there is a global, there's a global dimension to it where I think people are taking inspiration from the global happenings. But uh, how do we sort of further encourage, you know, institutions to take it up? That is what yeah. I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Good questions. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I can respond briefly. Yes. I think um, one of the reasons that translation studies has been important in Canada is because Canada is officially bilingual. And that is really the only reason that the School of Translation at the University of Ottawa exists, as far as I can see. It's not for uh, not because of an, an, an kind of implicit grand interest in translation or in you know international communications via translation. It has to do with something as simple and simplistic as Canada being officially bilingual and therefore it being nailed down in the constitution or some official document that everything the government produces in French must also be available in English and everything that's produced in English must also be available in French. So we have a very, um, very pragmatic undergraduate BA that trains translators who work into English and those who work into French and who go and get well paid, respected jobs as government translators, not all of them, but many, and then beyond that, we have developed this, this work in, in research on translation, how to teach it, all the issues that come up, the political questions that come up and so on. Um, but it derives specifically from the fact that, that this is um, an officially bilingual country. And I think, I think, or I, I don't know, but I think in the EU, there may be a development in that same direction. Um, less in certain countries than in others, uh, where also translation is a strong, strong requirement uh, among the EU countries. Um, but yeah, it's not as, not as, as rigid and as, as powerful as, as it has become here in Canada. Um, in India, there are also official languages, right, which must be translated, where Hindi is one of them, English is another one, and I don't know what the, what the uh, status of the other languages is. South Africa, 11 official languages. I don't know, there's one or two translation studies places or places where translators are trained. It's still very problematic, and that's something that I've experienced as well, where my translations don't get published or wait for half a year or longer to get published, but where the academic work on translation gets published. <laughs> so the actual translations are considered unimportant, but whatever academic stuff you produce, okay, that's good. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a real problem, a real problem, I agree. So how do, you, how do you create that academia in India? Yeah, I mean, good the, question. Uh, uh, good I question. don't want to deny that there's a lot of work people are doing, like there are many good professors and they are doing real good work. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, there's a lot of publications that are happening, but somewhere I feel, I think uh, the, the direction of funds, they don't flow into, I think, these fields. That is what I feel. I mean, somewhere if you, if there is more money coming into this, I think, 
i think then things will go i think you know in a right direction but somewhere there is a gap between the policy makers and the people who actually do the work so i think somewhere someone has to take the lead to bridge this gap and maybe then things might you know appear to be good at least for the people who are doing this work mm. this is what i feel yeah and where where a topic on feminist translation may not be the most popular for funders actually not that is what <laughs> <I mean. laughs> wise it's wise to start gently and then go off in your direction <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean somewhere i feel it's kind of discouraged you know at some level <laughs> uh, these kind of topics are actually discouraged that's what i feel yeah thank you um we have a question here um in the chat uh from julia constantino um which i think is really interesting and then she um uh, so they're writing more than a question. I just want to emphasize the cultural, political, economic, academic implications of the widened gap that's produced when we have to follow Western and Rutledge, for example, academic requirements, discourse, text formats, language use. Also that the prize has a political transcendence and that what Louise mentions about the way old European academic theory keeps on appearing is also related to that. It's difficult to catch up with new global North theory through legal sources and why should we all want that? And it may be even more difficult to have access to global South theory because of text circulation also because it seems academia, global and even local, keeps on pointing at global North theory as the center. Also, what about having parallel projects that circumvent global North requirements, constraints and limitations that we should read as cultural and political from ethical senses to try to heterogenize our thought and publications instead of following the homogenization of thought that is implied in some of the problems that have been pointed when speaking of academic publication. So. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So it's a big question. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Julia. Julia is from Unam, Mexico City. <laughs> yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. Mm hmm. Hala, don't you want to talk to that? Is <laughs> Hala there? I don't know. Is Hala? Yeah. Hala, you are muted. Yeah, I yeah. keep just disappearing, so I'm uh, <laughs> getting disconnected. So I was I was reconnected, and this is when I was muted again. So um, yes, I, I'm I'm afraid I missed the um, the, the 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 point that was raised. Mm -hmm. It it here. Let me, maybe I can summarize. Uh, it's it's very elaborate, but it has to do with um, what 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 I talked about old European theories constantly being recycled and considered uh, the, the, yeah, the most important always to refer to in your text, whereas the local material and the local theorization that comes out of local contexts and local experience and local traditions and local histories and so on is a, almost always set aside and reduces the heterogeneity of, of approaches to scholarship and also specifically, obviously, to feminist scholarship and feminist translation scholarship then. And how can one address that? How, can, how should, could that be addressed and improved? Well, yes, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. And I think it's uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, critical issues that face uh, feminist um, academics uh, in Egypt, because um, on, on the one hand, uh, we are constantly chased with uh, publishing in journals that have international ranking and uh, etc. And, uh, you know, um, uh, whether research published here or there counts or doesn't count. So even now within our own universities at Cairo universities, um, my research that is published in uh, American British uh, um, uh, journals um, ah. 
No. Oh. Dan. Yeah. So somebody says she or he would like to make a very short comment. So should we invite? Yeah, yeah. That's Tatiana. Tatiana from Novosibirsk. Oh, okay, Tatiana. I couldn't recognize yeah, yeah. Um, her name. Today, for some reason, I have this. Uh, um, I have arranged the, uh, you know, an icon for myself and uh, uh, I arranged, the, you know, my name written, um, my full name written, um, but for some, yeah, for some that's, reason. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Um, I'm Tatiana. Uh, uh, my name is difficult to pronounce for some people because it has German origin, but it was Russified. Uh, it's Barch originally, but it's Barchunova in Russian. And uh, I'm one of the contributors, and uh, I'm thankful that Luis has mentioned uh, that I have designed this concept of naive translation to explain some of the difficulties the uh, Russian, transla Russian translators face when they do uh, English-Russian translation. Um, so my short, my very brief comment is about uh, English as a lingua franca. Maybe I'm, you know, in this position, um, maybe I can sound as a Russian imperialist. Uh, I do not find anything wrong in having this lingua franca and the English as a lingua franca. Um, Russian used to be uh, a lingua franca for many years in, um, in the former Soviet, uh, Soviet space. And uh, it was convenient, and uh, many people used Russian, and many people now miss Russian as uh, lingua franca. We switched um, since you know Russian is the, um, as a lingua franca is uh, not politically correct for many people. Now we have switched to English as a lingua franca, and we are happy that English is such a simple language yes. compared to Russian. And we enjoy, you know, having such a wonderful instrument. Mm. So, you know, I can understand um, English native speakers who, who feel a sort of guilty or, you know, uh, who feel a sort of uncomfortable uh, of having English as a lingua franca in our professional milieu. But I think, you know, it's a great... Uh, uh, you know, equivalent of Latin or whatever uh, professional language, and I think you know it's fine that we have this multi uh, multinational, multi ethnic collection of books. And I can understand the paper written about Chinese translations, about mm -hmm. um, um, translations from Arabic, uh, from Spanish, from French. You know, I can do some French, but my French is is not enough to understand these intricacies of translations of Simone de Beauvoir uh, into English. And I really do enjoy this. It, it, it's a great facility for me. Uh, and um, I do not find anything wrong with you know, having this wonderful instrument, which is much simpler than, for instance, my native language, which is Russian and difficult to learn and uh, difficult to interpret. Thank you. And thank you, you know, for Hala and for you and uh, Olga for leading this. Yeah. Just to give, a, just very briefly, a, a different perspective on that. I don't think it's just the language, but the expectations on academic writing. As a migrant myself from Galicia, I'm a speaker of a, of a of minorized language. Of course, I speak Spanish as well. I speak Portuguese. Um, when I moved to Britain, and that was 10 years ago, um, I, I had to go through this very painful experience where I was told my research was rubbish. Mm -hmm. And it was not the topic or, the, or, or what I was saying, but the way I was saying it. Because I didn't have a clear, my aim in this article is, or because I was starting all my sentences with um, um, likewise, on the other hand, um, which is what you have to do when you're writing Spanish or in, in Galician, in other Latin languages. I had to go through that 
painful experience, which is why I think uh, for some, I mean, after 10 years here, of course, I can now um, write following the, the, the Anglophone conventions. But if I was uh, living, working in Galicia, in Spain, it would be difficult for me to be able to articulate my thinking in a way that meets the expectations of the Anglophone publishers. And if I kept publishing in Portuguese, yeah, I could be read in Brazil, which is amazing, all the things that are happening now in Brazil. I could be read in Latin America, in, in Spain, but not in the, in the, um, in the Anglo um, academia. So my experience is slightly different, but it's not about the language itself, but about the conventions around it. Mm, yeah, I see your point. Yeah, I see your point. But Louise mentioned, that, you know, this lingua franca effect, you know, that we have a sort of like unification. And um, it's not a great idea to have this unification, right? But sometimes it's very useful. And uh, um, it's, very, it's also useful for my teaching because, uh, you know, students would not understand. You know, other languages as well, you know, we have to teach English um, as a major foreign language at the university. Yeah. <laughs> but I've got the point. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anna, um, Anna is back. Do you want to pr uh, pr pr proceed with uh, your previous uh, talk? Anna? Hello. No, it doesn't seem she's here anymore. Hala comes and goes. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Coming <laughs> back, Hala. Yes. <laughs> Hala, you were interrupted when, when you were disconnected. Do you, would you like to proceed with what you were saying just before? Uh, otherwise, yeah. I have a, a question for you, but uh, I can ask. Yes, yes, go ahead with the question. I don't remember what I was saying. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember when I was interrupted. Yeah. But I, I, I got a bit of what Olga was mentioning about, you know, uh, getting published because uh, we face this problem. I, um, this is probably where I was interrupted when I said that we, we, we have to try to get published uh, in uh, recognized journals and at the same time we are not trained to use the discourse the conventions as you said right so we we we, we learn it the hard way for us for instance um, uh, young uh, scholars who postdoctoral who um, uh, are really keen on getting published know that their only way of uh, getting published is uh, through conferences you attend the conference and then after a conference you have uh, you know a publication and this is where the editors of this publication are keen on helping you develop your article to be publishable in those uh, terms um, and then when I write in Arabic using this uh, this the, the, the discourse in which I have been training myself for the past 10 years again it sounds very strange in Arabic because it does not you know uh, as you mentioned uh, you know uh, uh, we are not that um, you have to state your argument you have to point your uh, your your uh, your aim of research this is not done in the Arabic writing conventions it is much more tentative um, it is much more feminist because again feminist writing is not that um, we are trained yeah. to be clear about our arguments and aims but uh, feminist discourse allows this tentativity, right? That um, um, I think rather than I, I know uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so this is this is a major challenge, of course, and this is why I think publications like uh, uh, Routledge, the, the the idea, the work that we had to to do with many of the authors, trying to help them uh, 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 structure their essay along the historical uh, the historical preview, and then the critical uh, uh, positions, and then this and that, and to be very definite in the kind of statements. I think this is this is a big challenge. And I don't know whether this can be overcome easily or 
uh, even having a publication that is multilingual with English versions. I, I, uh, I don't see myself translating a paper for publication in Arabic, my own paper, I rewrite it when I'm, uh, when I'm, when I've done something in English for publication and then I, I'm, I'm producing an Arabic version, I, I'm actually uh, rewriting it because it is not a matter. And if you translate it, it sounds so odd and um, it would not be uh, easily uh, received by, uh, by uh, Arab readership. So, um, and this is why, for instance, uh, one of the most um, 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 uh, academically uh, solid journals in uh, our region is the journal Aleph, uh, which means the letter A, Aleph. It's a journal in comparative. Oh, no. Just being disconnected again. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, study. It has to write an article in Arabic. And then it is, uh, so I was asked recently, for instance, to write an Arabic, uh, uh, an article in Arabic on um, um, uh, new directions in autobiographical and life writing, right? On autobiographical studies. Because this is an area that there is a, where is a gap in Arabic studies. But then if you translate English directly, it will not be accessible uh, okay. to uh, readership. So, you know, there is the problem of uh, discourse there. It's not just a matter of uh, mm. languages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hence, I think, can I just add one more little thing? Um, Absolutely. The, the problem of what's called transnational feminism. It runs straight into the ideas, kind of, I don't know, uh, maybe illusions about transnational feminism crash into this problem of communication and of discourse and of customs and traditions of communicating. And I think they, that needs to be addressed or at least kept in mind when we talk about what is transnational and how effective is transnational and what should transnational attitudes be and achieve and so on and realize that there are considerable obstacles to transnational uh, uh, yeah, activities, interventions. I came across a term the other day called supranational. It dates from, from again, from the 1970s or so, came in, in the translation of a book that I've always loved in English but hated in German translation, which is Mary Daly's The Ethics uh -huh. of Gynecology, something like Gynecology, that. Gynecology, yeah. The fantastic book in English. In translation, it's a disaster because the poor translator couldn't handle it and but refers in some article or in the preface to the need to create supranational translation or, or feminist connections. And I think it, whether you use the term supranational or transnational or international, which we don't use because it refers to the United Nations and the World Health Organization and those operations, um, still we have to consider the enormous obstacles that there are and recognize them and not kind of impose uh, like a, my favorite Anglo-American Eurozone stuff on, on far away cultures far away from us, say north, north, south, global differences, um, but listen, and, and listen. And, and one of the best examples of someone opting out of this north, northern, and very powerful academic discourse I observed at a translational conference, I think where you and I met all about the first time, where um, a friend of mine from University uh, of Alame Tabatabai in Tehran stood up and in her conference presentation said, why should I run through all of these uh, Northern and North American uh, translation studies, wonderful people such as, and she listed all the names, what have they said or had to say about Iran, about Persia, about Central Asia, about any of the context that I am familiar with and that I need to work on as someone from the univer a university in Persia, she met a terrible backlash 
from certain people in the audience, but she has not published since in English and so on. She's working in her environment, in her context, and in her, on her local situation without mentioning all the big names of, of Western translation studies. And I think what a good rebellious approach, but yeah, again, absolutely. isolating, isolating, yeah. rebellious on the one hand, but isolationist on the other. And it's so complex. So, sorry, I have two. I think you should have both, rebellious and not isolationist. Oh, that's amazing. I have two questions here. Uh, first, uh, I think Cornelia uh, Slav um, Slavova, yeah. Slavova would like to speak before leaving. And then after, I'll have Alasami who wants to speak also. Oh, yeah, good. So, uh, Cornelia? Hello. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. You and, okay. Uh, Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to see Familia. And okay, is it working? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hello. I'm so happy to see all these familiar and unfamiliar faces. Um, since I have to go, I just want to say a few quick words. First, a big, big thank you, brief one, uh, to Hal and Luis. Um, for all the work they did, but also for their generosity. We were discussing uh, how come it's possible to have 46 contributions from all over the world. Um, and I have my own example. Uh, I didn't know anybody. Uh, Louise approached me, she found me through her PhD student or somebody and asked me to say something about gender and feminism in Eastern Europe. She encouraged me to do it. It's true, I had been working on this uh, issue for some, but this was, the first time in my whatever 35 years of writing that somebody approached me specifically asking encouragement and, and that is why we have such a diverse and vibrant and rich uh, collection of texts i haven't seen the book yet unfortunately my hop copy has not arrived but i have an idea i get it's the COVID, the COVID probably uh, problems uh, but i also wanted to say that i learned a lot through the process not just of contributing, but um, meeting in Poznan. I was one of the privileged and lucky ones to make it to Poznan. Thank you, Eva, too. She's not here, but she was the one who brought us together to a great extent. Um, and now that we have these facilities, I think we should do something. We should use it to get together. I'm just finishing another article for a Rutledge companion on uh, intersectionality. Um, I have to hand in my paper tomorrow. Uh, had I known of this possibility, I would have written a better paper, probably. Um, but maybe we can do something on um, uh, theory in feminist theory in translation. As I was listening to um, Wizzy's comment on all this old theory, um, I think if we do something like a bilingual or several languages, feminist theory in translation as a kind of introducing uh, feminist theory from other regions in translation, it can be in English, so they can reach out to, but also commenting on it or discussing um, feminist theory in translation, but also um, uh, putting on the map new theories. This would be another way of sort of um, enriching um, um, and coming up with new, new theory. Um, and maybe now that, that we have this wonderful network of 50 people and more, um, um, it would be easy. I don't know. I know it's a lot of work you need to break. <clears throat> I just, uh, this is, oh, hello. Um, okay, just to say a big thank you. Good luck in whatever you're doing. Uh, stay healthy. This was very inspirational. And thank you, Felicity, too, for organizing it. It was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Ayla, you, you can uh, take the micro. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, it's good to see you all virtually. Um, sorry, I'm a bit, uh, I'm new to this technology, so I, I tend to be a bit clumsy with it. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, hello, everybody. Hello, Louise. Hello, Hala. It's good to see you. Um, I would like first to thank you very much for, for, for the book and the great effort that you've put into it. Um, and thank you for giving me the chance uh, to contribute to it. Uh, it was a new experience. 
um, it was challenging, I have to admit, because as, uh, as Hella has already mentioned, um, I am more used to um, writing research papers uh, on literary texts. Um, and so it was, uh, it was uh, quite a new experience to, to write about um, uh, the technicalities of, uh, of translation and comparing translated texts to each other. Um, and thank you for bearing with me. Um, I have to admit that uh, uh, I struggled uh, with, with uh, my contribution, particularly the part that was related to uh, the historical perspective. I remember. Um, just I have a couple of uh, comments. Very, it's very short, and I think that um, uh, Tatiana has already uh, mentioned this, uh, or Cornelia. Um, I was thinking that maybe one area that could have been uh, perhaps covered um, in the book is the section on the translation of feminist translation, the translation of feminist translation. Um, the theory of translating, uh, of, of fem the process of feminist translation. And another thing is perhaps also um, is um, contributors writing about the experience of the translation from a native language to the English language, to go the other way around, instead of, um, and I think Louise uh, uh, referred to that, uh, at the beginning of the session, uh, the idea most of the um, most of the contributions are mainly about the experience of trans the translation from the anglo saxon world to uh, other parts of the world or other languages. Um, maybe uh, the translation from native languages to uh, the English language would have been i think would have been also interesting. Thank you. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I just wanted to to know what would you think of that? Ala, Louise, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I can. I can try a little bit. Uh, it's. I think it would probably be difficult to find a solid corpus to study in regard to translation of feminist or translation studies texts from Arabic to English, or from Italian to English, or from Polish to English. They're, they're, it might be difficult to find a solid body of work because English is not a language that translates. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it does not, it, our publishers do not produce a huge amount of of translations. And that's one of the really, really big problems of English language academic publishing is that it publishes to, in English to push it out into, into international markets, but is much less willing to move materials from other languages into English. So there, we I have a student right now who was looking into academic translation projects from French into English, from Chinese into English, from Arabic into English, all of which are funded by the source language governments. So by the French government, by the Arab Saudi government, by the Chinese government, in order to push and to promote translation into English, because otherwise it doesn't happen or it, it hardly happens. happens. And so that's one thing, Hala Sami, that, that really would hamper uh, an article. You could perhaps write on the translation of a particular author or one particular article, maybe two, um, but it would be, would be difficult just to find the material. I think also it has to do with, uh, I was just thinking uh, that uh, um, we need to find publishers also who are uh, ready to uh, to take over the process of translating from other languages into English. I um, I think we have uh, Hela Kamel maybe would would be more familiar with that. I think we have um, um, 
it's a problem to find publishers who would be uh, interested in um, sort of funding or uh, sponsoring the process of translating from, for example, Arabic into English, because it would be, it would be rather difficult to find a market to, um, uh, to be able to sell uh, such translations. What do you think? Um, I'm only familiar with, um, there was the, um, uh, what was it? It was, I think, a series called the Gar Garnet series uh, in London, I think. The person who wrote about it is Anastasia Volopoulos, who is in Manchester. Uh, she's specialized in Arabic uh, literature, and uh, there's a chapter in one of her books on On again. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, I think so. You know, one of the things that, that we, we keep being really focused on is publishers. There is such a thing yeah. as online publishing. And mm -hmm. online publishing yes. is something that has been perfected by a little group in, in the US called Words Without Borders. Uh, and mm -hmm. they publish once a month, I think, or even more often compendium of literary texts so specialized and and only online so yes. they, and they, they organize editors from germany from uh, from egypt to do contemporary literature from egypt in english translation contemporary work from german from mexico from wherever philippines in english translation and publish and function well and get funding from here and from there and from private donors um, that kind of a thing is not unthinkable in academia. But, mm -hmm. but I wanted to ask very quickly, uh, Louise, contemporary authors, um, mm -hmm. how do they deal with um, translation copyright? Because when you translate... Huh? I have to turn off the telephone. The telephone is really... Oh, yeah, all right, okay. So yeah, it was a generic question really um, about you know contemporary writing. There is the question of translation rights. Yeah, I, like back, perhaps you can I, I think all of that, it, online publishing is like, is like any other publishing where you have to have permission. So presumably, yeah. presumably yes. they, they get the permission um, yeah. from those authors or from those public, the, the original publishers. Uh -huh. Or maybe they look primarily for manuscripts which have not yet been published and then, and then but that's up to whichever editor is in charge of that particular, um, that particular project. Yeah. 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 Hala. yeah, but I was mentioning Anastasia Volosopoulos, uh, who is in uh, Manchester. She's uh, specialized in Arabic literature and she has a book on um, Arabic women, contemporary Arabic women's writing, I think. And there is a chapter in which she deals with uh, Arabic women who have been translated and mentions in particular a series, the Garnet series, um, by a publisher in London because at that point um, I think one of their consultants was Fadia Fakir if you might know her Hala Sami. Yes, Fadia I Fakir do. Is, a, is a scholar and, um, and, um, and a creative writer, a Jordanian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but the whole point is that uh, and Saqi, Dar al Saqi is another publisher in London, uh, London and Beirut, uh, mm -hmm. who, tra who publish into English. And there is a very small publishing house that I know of when I was in, um, at Smith College in Northampton. It's called Booklinks. And they, they publish mm -hmm. uh, from different languages. It's a small publishing house, but they have this kind of a very interna international agenda. But of course, they would publish novels, uh, fictional writing, poetry. Oh. Go and tell them I want to publish a book of feminist theory or, uh, you know, um, uh, Egyptian post-colonial approaches to, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think we yeah. stand a chance. I think, that, I, think um, I don't know how to mobilize perhaps um, uh, um, uh, academic centers maybe who manage to get uh, funds uh, you know, I think Z Books did a lot uh, for feminist uh, writing, right? Uh, yes. So, you know, publishers like, like Z who would be willing to uh, invest in, uh, in 
feminism and translation and perhaps to have two lines you know one which would be uh, uh, which would focus on uh, creative writing literary translation and another on uh, more theoretical philosophical uh, yes. um, we can also make an effort i think some effort needs to be done it is something i do in arabic i don't get the chance to do it in english because i wouldn't get uh, get it published but which is um, uh, connected to more of the activist side which is writing simplified you know it's a simplifying theory um, making it more accessible to uh, uh, we have reader. a series at women in memory for instance which is which is uh, women's issues in um, uh, in words and um, and uh, and, and pictures and images if you know mm. it halasemi right so so yes. we try to to do that perhaps it would be also possible uh, uh, to uh, find publishers who would uh, have even uh, a line of their publications. Uh, Edinburgh, we know, for instance, that Edinburgh University Press have a line of publishing which is uh, connected to Arabic literature. So most people who are working within Arabic literature and want to publish a book in English, they go to Edinburgh University Press. Perhaps, mm -hmm. I don't know, we can't do that uh, at Cairo University, unfortunately, because... Yes. Um, 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 uh, uh, we don't have a publishing house. We don't have, you know, it, 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 is, it won't be a priority. Not enough I, resources, uh, yes. Exactly. Even the National mm. Translation Center, which um, is a good uh, place for uh, translation, and it does these different, the variety of translation, but it translates into Arabic, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And we always have the, qu the question, who are we addressing? Are we constantly... Uh, um, yes. Do we have to put our time and energy in um, in uh, writing in English and uh, and being seen as competitors? So being uh, fought and undermined, or should we be writing in Arabic um, uh, to uh, work on our, our own readership? Uh, and when we work with our own readership, you know, Hela Sami knows that because we are in the same area. Um, do we translate uh, uh, foreign thoughts or do we produce our own? Work? This is something that is it's a dilemma, um, enormous, yes. and we we are constantly distracted. Yani, Hela, yes. we have to, we we do translations because we believe that people need to have access to this kind of knowledge. Our yes. students in the Department of English are privileged, but. All the other departments, they don't have the, the access. We are now having yes. a struggle, a problem with using Blackboard because suddenly we all have to use Blackboard. Um, our students yes. and us, we go and we watch uh, Blackboard tutorials and we know how to use it. Our colleagues in other departments have to produce Arabic versions of Blackboard tutorials. Can you imagine the kind, the amount? I think this can be done, you know, a piece of yes. research now it's with all those little yes. Blackboard videos now appearing with subtitling, with, uh, with, with, with an Arabic version because uh, you don't have even, you cannot even uh, use this very basic kind of instructions there. Mm -hmm. So yes. the question is always, should we write in English or in Arabic? Uh, and when we write in English, what kind are, are, are we to write? Uh, uh, um, Who are we addressing? Or exactly, or translate? Yes. Or when we write in Arabic, are we supposed? Should we? These are all choices. Should we write for a public, for the public, or should I produce knowledge for uh, young researchers who do not have access to this knowledge in uh, English? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> <laughs> The life is too short for everything. Yeah, no, but these these are very timely and and crucial questions as well. But we don't have an answer to all of them, of course. Yes, no, it's, it's true. good to keep thinking. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and, and our work, you know, Hala Sami and myself, our work gets for promotion, for the, the te technical things, you know, at university. Uh, we are delayed because we want to do other things, because we okay. want to do a translation, because uh, Hala's Hala's chapter on the, the chapter in this book might not count towards her promotion to professorship. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. She has other four articles and then she's not sure. She has to wait because, for the yes. committee's decision. Yes, it's... it's, it's, it's uh... <laughs> because they argued that they don't, uh, they don't acknowledge... Um, uh, book chapters don't count, they said. It has to be a journal article. article. <laughs> 
A book chapter is uh, is intellectual uh, uh, coffee, right? Which is a, yes. a cultural uh, kind cultural of activity. Exercise activity. <laughs> <laughs> intellectual exercise. So uh, yeah, that's that's terrible. I have been told the same as well. Actually, once I was told that I should do that kind of thing in the evening or during the weekend, but not during my working <laughs> hours because the university was not paying me a salary for that. <laughs> That was the most shocking experience in this respect. But yeah, it happened. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> uh, academic staff members are going through a lot, definitely. Yeah. We, we meet a lot of challenges. And then if you, put, if you add the term, the word feminism, mm -hmm. it makes it even yes. more like that's not proper <laughs> research. Uh, exactly. Sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Or it's out of date. Exactly, that's the other thing. That, yeah. And that's mm -hmm. something that is difficult to address, but I think <laughs> can, comes up comes up as well in these in this little in this little scuffle we had around feminism and queer and and you know other genders which have their own book and don't fit in or are deemed perhaps not to be suitable for a book that's on uh, translation feminism and gender. So. At, at the kind of liberal left wing part of society and of academia, all of the little groups struggle against each other rather than with each other for, for a certain amount of power and, and, and change and intervention. And this is, yeah, and so feminism often, at least in the last, in the, over the last 15 years now, like I said, there's this resurgence that I can see and I can feel, but at least for 10, 12 years, it was really not a place to go and not a place to write about and not, at least not in, in the Anglo-American Eurozone, out of date. It just, yeah, takes something like Me Too or like the, the mm -hmm. ISIS, ISIS misbehavior with, with Yazevi women or with Rohe or the trouble with Rohingya women and suddenly oh yeah hmm, yeah we forgot there's that feminist aspect too that needs to exactly be. exactly yeah so it, it's uh, yeah at the moment I think it's a good moment <laughs> so let's keep doing things publishing and talking and meeting <laughs> yeah making the most of technology <laughs> mm -hmm. yes uh, I have yeah. a last question uh, about that if it's, at, it's okay uh, I don't know if we have enough time Eloise to do oh. what? Uh, I just have a, a last question um, on that. Uh, it's a question for Ala, really. Um, as I have few colleagues working on Edouard Said, uh, um, uh, like my colleague Macron Abbas or other people, I'm curious to know uh, how your research, uh, Ala, uh, on the adaptation uh, of Said traveling ideas uh, to feminism. Uh, and your comparative uh, studies on Edouard Said and uh, write, uh, writing and Jean Said uh, Magdisi, uh, Magdisi uh, as writing was received by a researcher uh, in this field um, uh, around you, I mean. Well, um, you know, I come from a part of the world where we all have uh, an intellectual crush on Edward Said. <laughs> because for us, he has paved the way to uh, a completely new understanding of um, not only of the way we are perceived, but but more importantly, I think the way we perceive ourselves yes. um, um, being uh, uh, belonging to this part of the world. Uh, so um, uh, Said is uh, a kind of a you know foundational uh, reading for. Uh, Everybody, our students read Said as undergraduates, and um, um, and for me, because I was interested, and I've always been interested in autobiographies. I uh, I read his memoir, mm -hmm. um, and then when his sister Jean Said Makdisi published hers, Teta Mother and Me. Of course, I saw Said also. He came to our department. He gave talks. Um, he went. Uh, he was my uh, PhD supervisor's neighbor because he lived for many years in his childhood uh, in Cairo. So there is this also a personal, there is something personal there. And I I met Jean Said Makdisi, his sister, who um, lives in Beirut. And um, um, she went to school again with my uh, PhD supervisor. 
And uh, Jean Said Magdisi wrote a fascinating memoir, Theta, Mother and Me, uh, published in London and uh, I think by Syracuse in, in both. It's um, um, Edward Said wrote about himself, out of place. And Jean Said Magdisi wrote about uh, her life uh, her mother's and her grandmother's. Fascinating book. And it's also a, a social history to me, you know, about um, the different kind of education that women had in, in our part of the world, and especially that they stretched Syria. She has origins Syria, Jerusalem, and Beirut, uh, the Egyptian uh, period. So uh, I read the two memoirs, and then at a point I decided I'm going to write a paper on the two of them. Um, I wrote it very early on, 2005, I think it was my, my first academic kind of research post-doctorate. Uh, and um, I, I read it from a gender perspective. So for me, Edward Said was establishing his identity, self-assertive and so on, whereas um, Jean uh, was more of, her, her process of writing was more like an inquiry into the history of the region, her family, and the women in her family. But um, on another level, I'm currently translating Tita, but Mother and Me into Arabic because Jean uh, had a colonial education, like my PhD supervisor, so th they speak English uh, and they speak um, Arabic as a second language. Mm. Yes, so um, Edward yeah. Said's um, yeah. uh, traveling theory, in addition to his autobiography, which I, which I explored the two and I looked at the two texts, but I also, um, um, uh, I also like his uh, article, a very early one on traveling theory, in which he speaks of what happens to that theories and ideas are like human beings that they travel and during those journeys they change. There are things that are added to them, there are things that are taken away to them, and then they change more and more by whether they are assimilated or whether they are marginalized and so on. So um, I, I, I found this a very uh, interesting um, uh, article and I started th thinking of feminism and gender as terms. What happened to them when they came uh, to um, when they traveled so um, and and I started looking at them again from the prism of translation so I looked at what how is the term feminism yes. translated into Arabic used in Arabic and what are the journeys that were taken by the term so I I I, I came I, I went back to history and I saw I was looking for the, the use of the, the the equivalent of feminism by the Egyptian feminist movement so I identified the terms that they used and that they in the the, the feminist Egyptian feminist unions uh, program their manifesto uh, 1923 they used the two terms one in, in reference to women so it was the women's union and then within the program they had a section they had a national uh, demands they had social demands and then they had the what they call niswi which was a different term used to refer to what uh, derived from women niswi which i which has been used later on as the equivalent of feminism. So I looked at this and then I, um, uh, I, um, my point was that the term feminism did not travel to the Arab world, uh, but it developed more or less at the same time. And then it traveled westward with the, uh, with, with the international conventions, with the United Nations, the Mu'tamar um, al-Mexico conference, which was the first conference, women's conference in 1975. And then later on in the 90s, when the term gender traveled the other way around. So mm -hmm. gender came to us in the Arab world from the West. We do not have an equivalent. And this is why there is this gender trouble in translating the term gender. So gender has three equivalents in Arabic, which is very similar to, because I know Polish. So I know that in Polish, it's the same thing. They have two equivalents to the term gender. One, which is gender used as gender. And of course it is, it makes sense to use it because it is. It comes with its own history, its own uh, conventions, its own um, um, uh, theoretical baggage as a term, but also it is uh, faced with a resistance 
as an imported concept, as um, a Western part of Western agenda. You know, all of this, the whole package connected to uh, post-colonialism and uh, uh, neo-colonialism and imperialism. Whereas there is the other term, which is a kind of an equivalent translation, which is also the case with Polish, um, uh, derived from language referring to uh, um, uh, kind, type, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, there are two, these, these are the two translations. And, and I looked at, you know, the, the, the way that feminism and gender has been traveling here and there. Now, of course, if I were to write this paper now, I would also look at queer because there's a lot of by LGBT uh, plus Q groups in, in, in the Arab world uh, who are mostly active uh, online. And uh, they work on uh, uh, creating uh, language, inserting um, um, terms such as queer, trans into, uh, into Arabic language. So again, this is another dimension that is of interest. Yeah. Uh, if I were to write this article, I would add uh, this. I would also um, uh, look at, um, there is a group, the Wiki, uh, Wikigender. Wikigender is, um, um, you know, Wikipedia, Wiki dictionary. There is a Wiki gender who are working with terminology connected to gender, and they have an Arabic uh, web page. And I know some of the young um, men and women who are working with Wikigender on the um, uh, developing terminology uh, connected to uh, gender and so it's also um, my point is that translation is not just a matter of um, there is the aspect where you where, when you're coining terms I mean when you're coining terms where you go back to dictionaries where you look at etymologies where you look at uh, roots of words where you think of what is the equivalent in Arabic and then look at the root and try to think of you know how to how to how to um, derive uh, an equivalent and then there is another aspect how accepts accessible and acceptable that would be because we have a very early attempt with uh, the term gender uh, by uh, Alif, the Journal of Comparative Poetics that I mentioned earlier by the American University in Cairo. Uh, they had a volume uh, back in, uh, I think, 1999, very early on when the term gender be began circulating within academic circles, not only within developmental uh, documents, you know, UN, etc. cetera, uh, documents, but it moved within academia. And um, they suggested a term that did not uh, succeed at all, although I myself adopted it and used it in um, the translation of uh, Layla Ahmed's Women and Gender in Islam. Um, they went back to the roots. So gender is from gen, genus, right, which is the root. Uh, the, 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 and then they looked at the Arabic uh, 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 origin, which is Janasa, we have the three root uh, system in Arabic language, and they uh, coined a term, Junusa, which is um, uh, derived on the same rules of femininity and masculinity. So you have Unutha, femininity, ma uh, Dukura, masculinity, Junusa, uh, gender, in the sense of having a term that is um, derived uh, following the linguistic structure of femininity, masculinity, but it is a separate term. Mm -hmm. I, setting itself as based on culture rather than biology. And I use, and I use this term, but it was, um, it was ridiculed and it didn't, it didn't, uh, probably because of the, um, this was 1999, very early point in the third wave of feminism in Egypt. So this was not maybe the right time to come up with a new uh, term. Uh, now, looking at things in retrospect, it is, it is probably better at the beginning to work from within than to introduce something completely uh, outside, like, like politics. At the moment, you decide whether you want to be, uh, whether you want to be uh, revolutionary or whether you want to be uh, reformist whether to work uh, your way from 
from within or whether to come up with an alternative. Uh, 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 so Al Junusa was a completely, uh, um, and although it was, um, uh, uh, it was theorized, it was introduced in the volume published by, um, uh, on gender and knowledge, published by the American University in Cairo, but mo most of the articles did not use this term. Obviously, the authors of these same articles, contributors to a volume on gender and knowledge in 1999, of whom I wasn't one because I was still uh, taking my very early steps in, um, in, in scholarship and academia, they, 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 they chose the other alternative, which is the equivalent from Arabic, which just seems very uh, tame term, and no, and no meaning the kind, kind, type, right, uh, genre. Like genre. other than gender, in that sense. So yes, yeah, so the, 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 there is, and this is how this is how Edward Said's the traveling theory um, triggered this notion, and this is why I was even looking for submissions to the volume, hoping that people would submit papers where they reflect on the terms themselves. The the but it didn't happen. Maybe this could be a future project, you mm -hmm. know, a, a smaller book. On, yeah. on, on feminism, gender, queer, in translation. Yes, I can send you the, um, the book from uh, Cornelia Moser, who is uh, a member of Felicite, who has written uh, on this uh, very subject. Um, I was uh, mentioning her earlier in the introduction. Uh, I can send it later by, uh, by email if you want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely be really interesting. Uh, Olga, do you want to, and thank you, Ella, for, for answering all my questions. And Olga, if you want to wrap this up, uh, I think yeah. we have to finish. Well, yeah, I think we are a bit, um, yeah, um, it, it's um, 5.30 in, in the UK. I think we are uh, running out of time now. Thank you very much uh, again to everybody, to Luis and Hala for um, their insightful reflections, of course, but also to all the participants for asking really good questions and to the organizers. Um, I, I did take some um, good points and ideas uh, from the discussion. Um, we have to make the most of technology. We have to carry on doing these seminars and discussions. There is nothing preventing us from um, having this two, three hour discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's maybe a way uh, around these publishers uh, that, um, um, let's say, produce books in a, a non-accessible way to everybody. Um, right, okay, um, just that's all for me. Thank you again to, uh, to, to, uh, for, for the contributions and uh, yeah, see you soon. Yes, see you, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. You.